the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for another Bible preach this evening, Friday at 7.30 p.m. from Sydney, Australia. For all of those who are watching us through live streaming, uh, may the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you all the days of your life. Amen. I pray if we could all stand for the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 39. I said, I will guard my ways, lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred up. My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as handbreads, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but vapor. Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He heaps up riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. Remove your plague from me. I am consumed by the blow of your hand. When with rebukes you correct man for iniquity, you make his beauty melt away like a moth. Surely every man is vapor. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give e to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. Remove your gaze from me, that I may regain strength before I go away and am no more. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we thank the Lord Jesus again for another Bible preach as we are going through these some difficult times in relation to COVID-19, coronavirus, and we are having some lockdowns here in the Sydney uh, city, in some areas of Sydney. And we pray that these lockdowns are only uh, very shortly lived and through the grace and mercy and compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, may this all be gone away and never to come back ever again. Our session this evening, my beloveds, is um, the book of Revelation, and we are continuing in chapter 1 from verses 9 to 15. We shall read... The, from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15, inclusive. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patient of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Petmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, 
to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever and evermore. Amen. Well, in the previous um, sessions that we had in relation to the commentary on the book of Revelation, um, uh, up and until the f verse 8, it was just an introduction into this chapter. Now we are coming into verse 9 of chapter 1, and John the Beloved is actually going to reveal to us what kind of Jesus is truly is. It is not the Jesus that he was used to when he saw while he was on earth. And John the Beloved, he used to be the closest out of the 12 apostles to the Lord Jesus. It was he who actually put his head on the Lord's chest or bosom. And I'm sure he even heard the heartbeats of the Lord Jesus. He was so close, they, he embraced the Lord, he hugged the Lord, and, and walked with the Lord without being fearful uh, or blown away by the awesome, mighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Well, in verse, in, in verse 9 and, and thereafter, we will see that John the Beloved is saying that I saw Jesus here totally different to the Jesus I saw while he was in the flesh on earth. So we begin with verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, so beautifully said, I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation. John the Beloved when he came to put himself in relation to the Lord Jesus, he said, I am the servant of Jesus Christ. But then he comes to us and he says, I am your brother. It is absolutely wonderful and it's an absolute blessing to have one of the, one of the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus so close to the Lord being my brother and your brother. It is so wonderful to have such a brother. But he is not stopping at the word, I'm your brother. But he goes and says, I am also the companion during tribulation. John the Beloved is trying to tell us that not every brother is a brother. Brothers who have come from the same mother's womb... If that brother who came from the same mother's womb as I did is not there for me during my troublesome times, then he is not a true brother to me. So John the Beloved is he, here is defining who is the true brother to you. He's saying the true brother is the one who is there for you during your tribula tribulations. He is there he is your companion during tribulations and hardships. This is the true definition of a true brother. So the one who came from the same womb, mother's womb, if he is not there for me during my hard times, he is not truly my brother. He's, we just came from the same mom, but he did not give me a helping hand when I needed it the most. A total stranger may come and says, give me your hand and let me lift you up out of your trouble sometimes. This is a true brother. So I, John, your brother and companion in the tribulation and 
kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth, it is called the kingdom of patience. But the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in the next world, it is called the kingdom of glory. So the kingdom of the Lord on earth, it is the kingdom of patience. Why patience? Because his kingdom is going through tribulation. And when any one of us go through tribulation or hardships, we must acquire patience. Otherwise, we will not last that tribulation. That tribulation will overcome us rather than us overcoming it. We are going through, through some great tribulation as we speak now because of COVID-19 coronavirus. There are lockdowns here in Sydney, and it has been throughout the past year and a half on a global level. Every country, every, every citizen of, of a particular country felt the pain and the suffering and the tribulation of a lockdown, hardships, and not only lockdowns, and we lost some loved ones to our, our hearts because of coronavirus. A lot of people passed away and moved on. So this is a very difficult tribulation we're going through. Therefore, John the Beloved is saying, ask the Lord to give you patience in order to overcome it and come out of this tribulation triumphant and victorious. We need patience. Now, as we said, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus on earth, it is the kingdom of patience because he placed his kingdom in, an, in a world that is placed in the bosom of Satan. It is the world that is in total darkness and the Lord Jesus, who is the light of the world, came to shine forth his divine light on a dark miserable world living in misery in chaos and tribulation that is why those who walk in the footprints of the Lord on earth we acquire we need to acquire patience in order to be able to make it he's saying John the beloved was on the island. John was on the island that is called Pedmos. And Pedmos is a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, which is in Greece. In Greece. I was on an island that is called Pedmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In previous sessions, we said the word of God meaning the gospel, the testimony of Jesus Christ, the epistles. John the Beloved wrote three books, the gospel of John and the epistles of John and the book of Revelation. So when, the, when John the Beloved is saying, I was there in that island for the word of God, meaning the gospel, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, meaning the epistles, because in his epistles, he is saying, uh, uh, in relation to the Lord Jesus, he's saying, it is he whom we have seen with our own eyes. We have touched with our own hands. We were eyewitnesses. We are here to testify that we lived and walked and saw all the miracles and the wonders that Jesus Christ of Nazareth had done while he was on earth for those three years and four months. We are eyewitnesses. We are here to testify to what we witnessed right before our own eyes of what Jesus of Nazareth had done. All glory to his holy name. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day meaning Sunday. That is the Lord's day. And I know some people may say that the Lord's day is Saturday, Sabbath. Because in the Old Testament, when the Lord God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, 
he said to Moses, sanctify or make Sabbath, Sabbath hallowed because this is the day of the Lord. But that Sabbath is not a literal uh, day that we should take, but rather we should take it in a spiritual meaning. So that spiritual Sabbath is Sunday resurrection when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. This is a different topic totally. I don't want to spend too much time, but we did speak about it in previous and different lectures at some stage. But he was on the Lord's day, which is a Sunday. When the Lord rose from the dead, it was the Sunday. And he was in the spirit. In the spirit meaning he was in a contemplative, um, in a contemplative uh, state of mind. He was contemplating. He was contemplating on one thing. I believe John the Beloved was deep in thought in the spirit, wondering what, was, what has had, had happened to the churches whom he had established in Asia. Whom he had sent this revelation to the leaders of the seven churches in Asia. He's just wondering what has become of those churches. Lord, he's saying, Lord, I have been sent in exile to this island, Pedmos, in the center of the Mediterranean Sea. At the age of about 100, 105 I am old, Lord. I am tired. I am exhaust, exhausted. And I am in an island at this old age in the midst of probably, as, as history tells us, that that island was used to send people who had psychological issues, either demented or psychologically imbalanced. They used to send them to that island so that they cannot escape from it because it is surrounded by water from all over. So it was like a big open prison for those um, psychologically affected people. John is at the age of 100, 105, very old, very tired. He lived so long for the Lord Jesus, preaching the gospel, going from one place to another. At this old age, he's been sentenced to that island as a prisoner in the midst of demented and psychologically unfit people. He's saying, Lord, please come to my rescue. My heart is burning from within me, just wondering what has become of those churches in Asia. While he's wondering, and don't we all wonder and ask the Lord, what is going to happen, Lord? The situation is so difficult. I am at a lockdown situation. Everything looks dark, miserable, ugly. Looks like it's the end, Lord. I just wonder all this hard work, is it going to go in vain? I have gone the extra mile, Lord, for your name's sake. What is going to, what is going to happen? I see myself after all these years, it's gone to waste. What a waste, Lord. Until when are you going to be silent, Lord? Until when are you going to allow tribulations come against your church? Until when are you going to see your sheep scattered? We try so hard to bring young men and women to church. With one lockdown, everybody gets scattered. It is so hard to build. It is so easy to destroy. The Twin Towers in New York City. They, it took 20 years to build those Twin Towers. It took one hour to bring it down, crush down to the ground. 20 years to build, one hour to destroy. So hard to gather, so easy to scatter. So easy to scatter. Lord, until when? 
I work all my life for you, Lord. This is John the Beloved is saying. I worked all my life for you, Lord. And at the end of my old age, is this it? I am in exile in the middle of this island with sick people, wondering what's happened to your church, the church that I preached to, the church that I visited, the church that I established for you. Is this it, Lord? I was in the spirit wondering of what is happening around me. I don't know what to say, Lord, anymore. It is so sad. As if it's the end. But look, look what he sees and he hears. While he is troubled, John the Beloved, he says, and I heard behind me a loud voice as if as of a trumpet. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Wow. In the heart of our troublesome time, in the heart of us giving up on life itself, in the heart of saying it is finished, it is over, it is destroyed, it is useless case, it is shut in my face, I cannot walk any further. The moment that comes when you and I, I and you, begin to give up on life, we hear a loud voice behind us as of a trumpet. And my beloved, a trumpet is blown to give a warning. A trumpet is blown to make people awake and alert. Those who have gone astray, those who have gone to sleep, those who have said it is, it is over, those who have said there is no use, the doctor said you're going to die tomorrow. The whole world is saying it's the end. The government is locking us down and not letting us leave our homes. The day that you say and the moment that you say it is finished, Jesus says, my voice will be made known to you like a trumpet. I will shout from heaven and I will shake the ground beneath you to wake you up and remind you, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. Don't let this difficult situation make you lose faith in Jesus. Don't let this dark tunnel make you forget that he is the son of righteousness, S-U-N, and the light of the world. Don't let no situation make you forget that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And we said previously, Alpha and Omega are letters, alphabetical letters. And the word is made out of letters. Jesus Christ is the Logos. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. So when Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the word. I am the Logos, which is God. And I am the first and the last. I am the creator. In the beginning... Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The first and the last is the creator. I am the creator with the word created everything. I am the creator, the, the first and the last. And with the alpha and the omega created everything. So John the beloved and every one of us of the 21st century Christians... Jesus Christ is always the I am. He is always the continuous present tense. He is yesterday. He is today. And he is tomorrow. It is only Jesus 
that yesterday to him is present, the present is present, and the future is present, because he is the creator of time, and he is the creator of everything and everyone. Let us not forget, my beloved, coronavirus is absolutely nothing to who Jesus is. Absolutely nothing. I beg you, rejoice in these difficult times. Be glad and of a good cheer when it is going rough. Because our joy is Jesus Christ, not the people, not the situation, not the country we live in, not the position we are in. It is the Lord who is my joy and my happiness. Be glad, my beloveds. Be glad. The Lord is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is much greater than any tribulation, my beloveds. So do not be disheartened, but be of strong will and leave everything to the Lord. Put everything in the palm of his hands, the hands that molded us and shaped us and formed us. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And then the Lord says to him, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And we said, Asia symbolically represents the world, the entire world. That's what we said previously. And Asia, we said, it actually refers to affliction, tribulation, hardship oppression that's what Asia means here when we said that the Lord put his church established his church in this entire world where it will be oppressed and suppressed and it will be afflicted and there will be great tribulations coming against the church but he said to John the beloved and through John to all of us he's saying do not be disheartened and discouraged for I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last I am the creator who creates everything with one word and my voice is like a trumpet with a trumpet everyone gets warned and everybody gets alerted when I speak things move and things come about And he says, write to the seven churches which are in Asia. The first church, Ephesus, followed by Smyrna, followed by Pergamos. Number four, Theatira. Number five, Sardis. Number six, Philadelphia. And number seven, Laodicea or Laodicea. All these names are of Greek descent or origin. They are Greek. The first church, and we said, the Lord Jesus does not have churches. The Lord Jesus has only one beloved church of his own. Because uh, St. Paul says that the church is the body of Christ and Christ is one. So therefore his church is one. But these seven churches are the seven stages which the beloved one church of Christ is going to go through until the end. The beginning of the, the first stage of the church of Christ is called Ephesus. And the word Ephesus in Greek means the beloved one. The beloved one, Ephesus is the first century. The first hundred years is Ephesus, where the, the disciples of the Lord Jesus and the followers of the Lord Jesus walked according to the way the Lord wants his church to walk. And that was through humility and simplicity of heart. None of them seeked 
thrones. None of them seek positions. None of them strive to be seen above and beyond everyone else. Everyone humbled themselves before the Lord Jesus. That's why the Lord called the first stage of his beloved church, Ephesus, you are my beloved. When my church walks in humility and true love. And then, that's the first century, followed by the second stage, Smyrna. Smyrna means the bitter one. And it was the second and the third century. The second and the third century, it was the bitter stage where the church went through. And it was the stage of martyrdom, where the Roman Empire, um, through their some great, terrible emperors, um, when they started slaining the Christians, whoever professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was persecuted, was killed for the sake of the name of Jesus. It was the, uh, the stage of martyrdom, second and third century. It was the bitter century. But my beloved, through that difficult time, through that tribulation, through that persecution, through that martyrdom stage, great saints came out of that stage. And one of the greatest saints to be seen in the world was St. George. St. George is a saint appearing in that period between the second and the third century. So Smyrna is bitter one. Then followed by Pergamos. Pergamos, my beloved, is after the third century where the Roman Empire for the first time receives the Lord Jesus and becomes Christian. The King Constantine, who was the son of Helen, his mom, the Queen, Queen Helen, Constantine converted to Christianity and then the, con the government or the empire became a Christian empire and the church became united with the government. And it's called Pergamos because the word Pergamos literally it is referring to the matrimonial bond. It is the bond between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. It is that bond of matrimony what the word Pergamos refers to. So Pergamos is the stage where government, where state, church and state became one. Church and state became one. So dangerous. So dangerous, my beloved. And this stage was after the third century. It was actually after the decree of Constantine in 313 AD, where he asked that, what he said that the Roman Empire now is, a, is Christian. And then he called in for that universal senate of Nicaea in 325. When Church and state became one, united like a matrimonial bond, Pergamos. What happened in that period? And it was a period after the third century up until the 11th century. And the fourth century, fifth, all these centuries, great heresies came about. Um, Arios, the heresy of Arios and so many heresies, there were people coming and saying nonsense about the Lord Jesus. Some people claimed that Jesus was only spirit. Some people claimed that Jesus was only flesh without divinity in him. So there was absolute heresies left, right and center. And why heresies came about, my beloved, when when everything goes smoothly, when the government is no longer persecuting the church, when the church is now so freely uh, proclaiming the good news, when the church is now so openly speaking about the Lord and the government is embracing the church, when that kind of a freedom comes to the church, great heresies come out. It is great disasters will come out when the church lives in peace. It is the human nature. The moment you live comfortable, 
you forget about God. It's human nature. The moment we are comfortable, we forget about God. And even if we don't, when we pray to Him, our prayer is at a surface level. Our prayers are so shallow, so cold, so meaningless. But when we are in trouble, oh, we mean every letter and every word we say. We mean it. We live it. It comes out of the core of our heart when we are in trouble sometimes. But the moment we're free, who cares about what God says and what God wants? So after all, my beloved, Corona is good. You know, how many people are now sitting at home, not leaving home? In the thousands, in the millions. Would that have happened if there was no Corona lockdown? I doubt it. Maybe it's good for us to stay at home for a change. Maybe it's good for us to spend some valuable time with family and see our kids, see our partners, husband and wife, children, mom and dad. It is good to spend time with the family. We, before my beloveds, we were so busy. We were so busy chasing this empty world we were so busy planning for this and that and thinking about traveling and thinking about eating and thinking about dancing and singing and drinking and thinking about having so-called fun. We forgot that what is valuable is the family. It is the family that makes a society. But when the family is wholesome, the society is good, but if the family is divided and weak, the society is destroyed. So it's good that we are staying at home. It's good. We need it. Enough going out all the time. Relax. Put on the brakes and sit with yourself. And ask yourself, where are you heading? What are you doing with your life? It's not yours. It is God's. And one day he's going to ask for it. We need to stay at home more often, my beloveds. Going out in the street is not healthy. It's not healthy. When there was great martyrdom happening in Smyrna, second and third century, great saints came out. When freedom came about and the church united with the state, great heresies came out and great divisions came out, my beloveds. And the greatest schism of all happened in the 11th century in 1054, where the church got divided into two parts the East Orthodox and the West Catholic. This all happened during Pergamos. This all happened when government and church united. Politics cannot come into the church life because the Lord Jesus does not know deviations. The Lord Jesus does not know hypocrisy. The Lord Jesus does not know some dark little corners over there. The Lord Jesus is the light of the world. Everything must be straightforward. Do not deviate from the truth. The world is full of lies. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, my church will never unite with the world. And if the day comes that anyone comes and says to you that the church must unite with the world, is speaking from the mouth of Satan. That's a lie. The world is darkness and the church is the light of, the, of that world. Can ever light unite with darkness? Impossible. It is either light or dark. The two together, never. Jesus is the truth. Satan is the father of all lies. 
there cannot be unity between the church and the world. This is the word of the Lord, not mine, not anyone else's. So when the church unites with the world, that's what we're going to get. Coronavirus. And there are other things coming about, my beloveds. There are some great stuff happening in the, in the near future. Much greater than Corona. Much greater than Corona. I don't want to scare no one. But what's coming? My goodness. The world has not seen yet. The world has not seen yet what's coming. Do you think it's a joke when people deny God and they think they can get away with it? Do you think it's funny when you say, I don't care about God and I'm, I can do whatever I want? Do you think you can get away with it? Do you think that your wealth and your fame and your power and your, and your wisdom, do you think you can do whatever you want and there is no one watching you and no one seeing what you are doing and no one can stop you? My dear friend, you have no idea what the Lord has prepared for the world in the very near future. No idea. The Lord Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is God, the Creator. There is no other God but Him. Hallelujah to this. I will proclaim this. I will confess this. I will profess this even if they put a sword on my neck. Let they kill me. But they can't take me away from my Jesus. He is the only God. He is the only way. He is the only truth. And there is no one else but Him. This is the whole story of our existence. We live for this man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If people come back to Jesus... Regardless what your color is, what your race is, what your religion background is, if you truly, with, your, with, the, with a, an absolute contrite heart, with a, a humble approach, you come back to Jesus, you will see if Jesus is who he is or not. Jesus will prove to you that he is the only way. He is God that was revealed in the flesh over 2,000 years ago. This is the truth, my beloved. We need the Lord. Pergamos led to division in the church, the great schism in 1054. The church became West Catholic and East Orthodox. And then after the division, what happened? Theatira came. Theatira is the 12th 13th, 14th, 15th century, the medieval ages. Theatira means, it, that's where the English word comes from, theater. And who goes on that theater, on that stage? Actors. So what is theater, my beloved? Or, in other words, who is an actor? An actor is a person that has taken upon him or herself a... A, a, a position or a personality that is not his or hers. Example. In reality, that person could be a teacher. But on stage, when he goes on the stage to act, they give him the role of a king. Does that make him really a king? No. In reality, he is a teacher. But during that act in that theater, theatrical stage... He is, a, he is a king. Now, if that person believes that he's a king, he is deceiving himself. You're only acting it. Therefore, 
Who is an actor? An actor is a person that reveals himself to the world, which is not the truth, not the reality of life or of that person. He shows himself as someone else that he is not. If you're a teacher, you better show the world you're a teacher. Don't say I'm a king. Theatira, my beloved, is when the church acts on one another. Meaning, I am faking it. When I say to my brother, I love you, when I am truly lying, when I deep down, I don't really love my brother, but in front of my brother, I say, I love you, but deep down, I have no love for him. I'm an actor. I am theater. I am theatira. Christianity, the church became a theatrical stage. The children of God began acting on one another, faking their true identity. And you want the Lord not to be angry? My goodness. We keep on talking about love. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it, my beloveds? Theatira, the medieval ages. And then Sardis. Sardis, my beloved, is, it means a selected group that is set aside from the rest. A selected group that they have separated themselves, set themselves aside from the rest. And that is the 16th century where Protestant came about. Martin Luther. Protestantism came, that is Sardis. And Protestantism said that we have set ourselves aside from the apostolic churches. Why? Because, you know guys, the apostolic churches got it wrong for 16 centuries. Now we will show you the way. We've separated ourselves from the rest of Christendom. And now we are going to protest against the Catholic Church. And we're going to show the rest of the Christian world what the Holy Bible is all about. They set themselves aside and destroyed a lot of foundational, fundamental teachings of the master of all masters and the teacher of all teachers, Jesus Christ. Sardis. Another division. Pergamos made a huge schism take place in 1054 where, the, where Christendom became East and West, East Orthodox, West Catholic. And Sardis, a division came out of the Catholic Church in the 16th century by Martin Luther and he protested against the Pope uh, of Rome and they were called Protestant from the word to protest. And Sardis continued from the 16th century up until the end of the 19th century. And now we are coming into the 20th century and the 21st century. My beloved, the 20th century and the 21st century are together, hand in hand. They are called Philadelphia and Laodicea, the last two stages of the beloved Church of Christ that is going to go through until the coming of the Messiah, the second coming of the Messiah, to take his bride without a blemish, without a stain, to the Father's house. 20th century and the 21st is Philadelphia and Laodicea. Philadelphia is a, it is a compounded word. It is, again, we said it's a Greek word. It comes from phelos means love. Adelphos means brother. So Philos Adelphos, brotherly love. Philadelphia means brotherly love. And Leodikia, compounded word. Leos means nation. Dikia or Dicia means veered of the road. 
So Laodicea is the nation that has veered off the road of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philadelphia, brotherly love, Laodicea, walking away from Jesus. We are living in the last two stages of the church of our Lord Jesus. We are living in the end of times. And on every social media level, you open all these channels and platforms, everyone is talking about brotherly love. Everyone is preaching the gospel. Everyone is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the savior. Everyone needs to come to Jesus. Wherever you go, everyone is talking about Jesus. There is so much brotherly love happening that has not been seen throughout the 2000 year history of the church of Christ till this very moment. But at the same time, for as much as there is so much love given to Jesus and talking about Jesus, at the same token, there is so much and so many people walking away from the Lord Jesus within Christendom. We're living in the end, the last stage, my beloved. Look at the church of the Lord. It is going th through tribulation very badly. There is so much division in the church. The church is divided. The church is weak. The church is in turmoil. But there is a lot of preaching. But there is a lot of division at the same time. You know why? Because genuine love is missing. True divine love is missing. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I need to watch the time. If we were to define God, yet God is so immense, so awesome, so beyond any, any comprehension, any intellectual capacity, but in our human uh, limited intellectual capacity, if we were to define God, how would we define God? I would say in a nutshell, in a very simple intellectual human being capacity, I'll say God is love and humility. These are the two pillars that define God. Then God is the Holy One. God is the light of the world. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. God is the Good Shepherd. Before of all of these, He is love and humility. Love, knowledge, humility, wisdom. What relates to love is knowledge and what relates to humility is wisdom. It is impossible for any one of us to gain wisdom from God unless we humble ourselves before Him. And it is impossible for any one of us to love God unless we get to know Him. But the problem is, in order to get to know God, I need humility because it is only through humility I get closer to God or God gets closer to me. Then He brings me closer to Him. Without humility, there is no knowledge of God. And without knowledge, there is no love. And without humility, there is no wisdom. You see, I can gain love through knowledge, but I need wisdom in order to protect it, to preserve it, and to increase it and multiply it and enlighten it more and more. Wisdom protects and preserves and multiplies love. Without wisdom, I'll lose the love that I gain through knowledge. In the church of the Lord Jesus of the 21st century, Laodicea, there is everything available except two things. True divine love and true humility are absolutely missing. That's why the church is veering off the road of the Lord Jesus. True love is missing. Oh yeah, I love you. So easily said than done. It is so easy to say things, but so hard to do them and fulfill them. 
The Lord Jesus is the God of hearts, not the God of tongues and lips. Love and humility are missing. No wonder the church is veering off the road. Philadelphia, brotherly love, Laodicea, walking away from Jesus Christ. And the Lord, and the Lord said it. When the Son of Man comes again the second time, will he find faith on earth? He won't. That's why he's going to come back. So when the Lord comes back, that means there is no faith. There is no faith. Then I turned, verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a, one like the Son of Man. And he turned to see the voice, and he sees seven golden lampstands. And in the middle, in the midst of these seven golden lampstands, he sees one like the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ himself, divinity revealed in humanity. This is the Son of Man. He sees him in the midst of those seven golden lampstands. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Golden, why? Because the church of Christ is his body. The body of Christ is gold. What does that mean? Meaning his body is incorruptible. His body cannot decay. His body cannot see and taste and, 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 and go through death. Gold never changes. Never rusts. Never fades away. Gold always remain gold. The body of Christ is gold. That's why he saw seven golden lampstands. And those lampstands are the churches and they are the light. He said, you cannot hide a city built on a mountain. My church is the light of the world. It is a lampstand shines through this dark world. But this lampstand is gold because the church is my body. The body of Christ is gold incorruptible, cannot decay, cannot die, cannot wither away. Gold will always remain gold, and the body of Christ never changes. Gold never changes. And this one, like the Son of Man, he was clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. He was clothed down to the feet from neck to the feet he was clothed and around the chest there was a golden band a belt a golden belt his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire my goodness john the beloved what in what way are you describing jesus this is not the same Jesus you saw on earth. You saw him so humble, so weak, so silent, so quiet, so down to earth. What is this eyes of fire? I saw them clothed with a garment down to his feet. Clothed from neck to toe with a garment. Here he's talking about Christ's power in protection. Christ's power in protection. And when he talks about and, and girded about the chest with golden band, Christ's power in his actions based on love. So, covered in a garment from the neck to the toes, it is Christ's power and protection. And girded with a golden band around the chest, it is Christ's power in his actions based on love. And also, 
His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. Christ's power in his redemption. Clothed from neck to toes, Christ's power in protection. Girded with a golden band around the chest, Christ's power in his actions based on love. And his feet, as if they were ref as of refined brass, going through an inferno of fire. It is Christ's power in redemption. Girded with a garment. The body is covered with a garment. My beloved, when our father Adam in the Garden of Eden, when he ate from the forbidden tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened to Adam? The Bible teaches us that Adam, after eating from that tree, he saw himself naked. Jesus Christ, the latter Adam, came to clothe our nakedness, to cover our nakedness with the dress, with the garment of righteousness. He covered our nakedness, sin, with the garment of righteousness. He covered our nakedness, death, with the garment of righteousness, eternal life. He came to cover our nakedness, to wash us clean and give us eternal life, garment white all the way from the neck to the toes. And girded around the chest with a golden band or a belt. My beloveds, when we wear a belt, don't we put the belt around our waist? That is the normal thing every one of us does. The belt is used around the waist, not around the chest. But why is John the Beloved saying that this belt was around the chest of the Lord Jesus? To tell us, my beloved, and I said the belt around the chest reveals Christ's protection in his action based on love, in his deeds based on love. The chest one side, the Old Testament. The other side of the chest, the New Testament. The chest represent the Word of God, the Holy Bible. Both in its, both testaments, Old and New, is the chest. And it is gold. Why? Because the Word of God is endures forever. It is the never changing Word, like we said, gold never changes so as the word of God is that goal that never changes forever. So the belt was put around the chest. One side, Old Testament. The other, New Testament. The word of God is gold. And the belt, you put it on when you are getting ready to go to work. You tie your belt. Tying the belt represents I'm ready for work. Jesus came, clothed us with his garment, white righteousness, the dress of the wedding of the king. It is the dress of the kingdom, the father's house, with no blemish, no stain. He came to wash us clean and, and clothe our nakedness with his own garment with his own righteousness and he said I did this and I gave a promise I came and I tied my belt and my belt is my word and my word is my name and my name is my honor is my identity and my name is my glory and I will not give my glory to no one else and I made a promise that I have come to save you and I have come to redeem you and I have come to tell you that I am with you all the days of your life and until the end of all ages I have built my my church on the rock, unshakable, unbreakable. Neither hell will prevail against it, nor any storm, any wind, any cyclones, any rains, any floods. Nothing will shake my church, for I have built my church with my own precious blood on the cross on Calvary. Do not be afraid, my children. No one touches the church that Jesus had built with his own blood. No one. 
No one. Every weapon targeted against the church shall fail. Every snare placed against the church shall be decimated. No one prevails against the church of Christ. No one. The gate of Hades will not prevail. For I have crushed the head of the serpent. I have crushed Satan under my foot on Calvary, on the cross. My church shall stand till the groom, the heavenly groom, comes back again and takes her without a blemish, without a stain. But the Lord said it, he who endures till the end shall live. Be faithful till the end, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2.10. Be faithful till the end, and I will give you the crown of life. So the garment clothed us, and that nakedness was gone once and for all. And then that belt He came, he was ready to deliver us. He was ready to redeem us. He was ready to save us. The good shepherd, the the good shepherd who died on the cross in the flesh with his precious blood, his word is his promise that I will deliver you. And he did. He did it till the end, the end, the death of the cross. And he rose from the dead on Sunday to say, I have overcome Satan, sin, condemnation, and death. I have come all these four enemies, overcome them. And whoever has Jesus in him, he shall overcome these four enemies. Satan, sin, condemnation, and death. And then his head and hair were white like wool. Sorry, I've maybe taken a little bit longer, but I'm almost there. His head and hair were white like wool. When you go back to the Greek text, his head, my beloved, means the hair over on his head. Not his head as in head, but the hair on his head. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense that his head and his hair was white. Doesn't make sense. So in the Greek text, the head represents the hair of the head. And the hair here represents the beard, my beloved. Just like my one white (laughs) but of course it's not the Lord's the Lord is something else and his head the hair of his head white and his beard what that what were they white as wool and his head and hair were white like wool as white as snow He brings wool and he brings snow. Both are white. The hair of his head is white and the beard is white like wool and like snow. And straight after this, and he says, and his his eyes like a flame of fire. My goodness. He's saying his hair is white. His hair and his beard are white like wool and as white as snow. And straight after snow, he says his eyes are like fire, are like a flame of fire. Unbelievable the way John the Beloved is describing the sweetheart of all sweethearts, Jesus Christ. Unbelievable. My beloved wool is used for winter and snow is for cold. Wool is heat and snow is cold. Jesus Christ, my beloved, is saying, I am there for you when you are hot for me and when you are cold for me. I am there for you when you are wool hot close to me. And I'm there for you when you are snow cold, miserable, distant from me. You can walk away from me, but I'll never walk away. You can deny me, but I, Jesus, never deny you. You can betray me, but I, the Lord Jesus, I'm faithful always. 
You can be miserably cold, but I am the sun, S-U-N, that will melt that snow and I'll bring you back to me. And when you are wool, hot, close to me, I'll make sure that you stay with me always. Because I made a promise. I am the savior and the redeemer of the world. Whether wool close or snow distant, Jesus is always going to be the same. Loyal, faithful, savior, redeemer, sovereign authority, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. God, the creator of everything and everyone, visible and invisible. And that's why after snow, he says, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. And wherever you read the word eye or eyes in the Holy Bible, replace that word with knowledge. The eye in the Bible represents knowledge, my beloved, meaning that Jesus, when he was girded with the golden belt around the chest, and we said the golden belt around the chest is the Holy Bible, both Old and New Testament, the word of God, the Holy Bible, the Word of God, His promise, meaning His eyes, His knowledge, His Word. In, with His Word, He made a promise that I am there for you all the days of your life. And all the days of your life, meaning literally every single moment of your life. Whether you were at one moment wool, hot for me, close to me, or you were snow, cold, distant from me, I made a promise that I am with you all the days of your life and until the end of all ages. Never fear, for Jesus Christ of Nazareth is always near and here. Never fear. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. Christ's power in redemption, his feet were like fine brass. Fine brass is copper. Fine brass meaning it's pure because he is the only pure out of all the human race. The only human being that was pure in the flesh is Jesus of Nazareth. His feet were like fine, refined brass. As if refined. In what? In a furnace. A furnace is a concentrated fire. Meaning, the temperature of a furnace is much higher than a normal fire. Because in a furnace, that fire becomes concentrated and the heat gets multiplied a thousand times more over. His feet were in the midst of a furnace. And his feet were what? Brass. Fine brass. Pure brass. Out of all the substances, if you put a silver in fire, the silver becomes liquid. If you put gold in fire, the gold becomes liquid, yet gold is more expensive than silver and definitely more expensive than copper. But when you put the copper in fire, it becomes harder and stronger a thousand times more. You cannot break the copper once you expose fire to it. So copper does not melt. Copper becomes stronger when it is exposed to fire. His feet, fine brass, copper, put in what? In an inferno. A thousand times more strong heat than a normal fire. Meaning, Jesus' power in redemption. He came to deliver us from Satan, from sin. Sin was like that fire that was burning us alive. When Jesus came to save us, he had to walk in our sin. He had to take our sin upon himself. The crown of thorns is the sin of the world, the sin of every human being. He took 
our sin and, pl- and put it on himself. When he came to deliver us from our sinful status, he had to walk through that fire of sin. But when he walked through the fire of sin to pick us up and bring us out of that fire, his feet are fine copper. So when, his, when he walked with his feet in that fire, his feet became much stronger. And those feet were placed as if in an inferno, which is much, much stronger in heat and power than a normal fire. So when he walked in that fire, the The fire of Christ burnt the fire of Satan and sin and condemnation and death. Through the fire of Christ, the fire of sin was decimated. So when you deliver someone, you got to run to that someone. You walk with your feet. Jesus came. His feet are fine copper. He stood in the midst of our hell. He stood in the midst of our sin. And he, he burnt the fire of sin with his holy fire. And picked us up and brought us out of the fire. And that's why I finish it off with this. And he says, John the Beloved, after the feet as if they were put in a, in a furnace, his voice as the sound of many waters. Oh my goodness. You see, what puts the fire off is water. We have so every, almost every year in Australia bushfires. How do they put those bushfires off? They use water. Water decimates fire. Puts it off. So we were in that fire of sin. We got burnt. We were hurt. We were afflicted. We were rejected. We were demented. We had lost self-confidence. We were scarred mentally, emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually. In every aspect we were scarred. This needs healing. John the Beloved said, after the Lord Jesus took us out of the fire of hell, he soothed every pain, every burning sensation, every sorrow, every tear, every scar, he soothed it with his voice because his voice was like many waters, the sound of many waters. My goodness, when Jesus comes... And speaks to us. His voice is so soothing. Like the water. That puts that fire off. His voice. Soothes the pain. And makes it disappear. I was so hurt yesterday. But today I'm standing. I was so alone yesterday. But today I am. Strong again. I was lost yesterday. But today I am found. I was dead yesterday, but today I am alive and living. I was so weak yesterday, but I'm so powerful and strong today. I lost hope yesterday, but I am all full of hope and energy. I want to embrace and engulf the whole world for Christ. Yet yesterday I was given up because his voice was like the many, the sound of many waters. When he came with his voice and said, My son, do not fear. I'm with you, my child. It is your Lord Jesus. It is the good shepherd speaking to you. It is your God and creator. It is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. I have taken you out of your misery. And I brought you into the bosom of my... Into the core of my heart. And I have embraced you into my bosom. Do not worry. Do not be weary, for my voice, I have made it known to you. And when you heard the voice of the Good Shepherd, all miseries were no longer to be seen. I am wholesome again. Jesus is good. His voice. 
soothes the heart, the soul, and the spirit. His voice reaches where the unreachable is reached, where the impossible is made possible. His voice and the Song of Solomon, and I'll leave you with this. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, the bride is describing her, her heavenly groom, Jesus Christ, and the bride is the church, is the baptized soul in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One God, Amen. The bride is describing her sweetheart, her lover, her, her groom, Jesus Christ, to the angels of heaven. She's saying, the voice of my beloved is coming from afar, from a distance. The voice, as many waters, the voice of my beloved is coming from a distance, leaping over the mountains, jumping over the hills. The voice of my beloved is coming from a distance, leaping over the mountains, ju jumping over the hills. Quickly, mountains and hills both require climbing. There is a difference. The mountain, the surface is strong, but the hill, the surface is soft, it is sand. When you climb as a hill, you climb up one step, you go down 10. It is so soft, you just fall and slip and slide back again. You get up again and you climb and you slide back again. You climb and you slide, you get up and you fall, you get up and you fall. The hills, the bride in the Song of Solomon, she is saying the hills are the difficulties of my life, i.e. the sins, the inequities, the wrongdoings, the foolishnesses, and the shortfalls of my fallen human nature. These are the hills, the difficulties of my life. I sinned, I went and repented, and I sinned again, and I went and repented, and I sinned again. This is the sandy ground of the hill. You climb and you fall, you climb and you fall. But she is saying, do not give up when Jesus is your groom, my beloved soul. Do not give up, for his voice not himself, but his voice is coming from a distance, leaping over the mountains, jumping over the hills. The hills are the difficulties, sins. The mountain is the impossible of your life. Hills, difficulties of your life. Mountain, the impossible. You climb the mountain, much easier than a hill, but a time will come when you face a huge bulldoze and the road comes to an end. You cannot go any further. That is the impossible. So what is the impossible of the human race in its entirety? Death. For no one died and rose from the dead by on their own accord by themselves. Only one did it, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He placed it and he took it again. He died and he rose from the dead by himself. Mountains is the impossible of my life. Death, when I die, I cannot live again. Jesus died and rose from the dead. Hills, difficulties, my sins. She's saying his voice is leaping over the mountains, jumping over the hills. This is an encouragement to all of us. The voice I heard, his voice, was like the sound of many waters, so soothing, so comforting, so delivering, so redemptive, his voice is. The difficulties of my life and your life, which are the sins, and the impossible of my life and your life, which is death, both death and sins are under the foot of Jesus Christ. For his voice was jumping over the mountain, death was leaping over the mountain and jumping over the hills, sins. Everything is under the foot of Christ. Everything, my beloveds, is under his feet. Trust in the Lord. And trust when he whispers in your ear.
for his voice saves, delivers, redeems, and soothes every pain and sorrow. <sighs> On Good Friday, the Lord Jesus wiped all the hills of your life, all the sins of your life. And on Sunday resurrection, he wiped the mountain of your life, death. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, he trampled death under his feet and rose triumphantly forever. He who has Christ has eternal life. An eternal life where no sin ever is in existence. Holiness only is there. That is the voice of the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last for all of us, my beloveds. Enjoy your stay at home, thanks to Corona, and enjoy the, uh, the family that you are in, the family that you have, the family that God has given you. Enjoy it. With the Lord. I urge you, those who are watching us and hearing us, read the Holy Bible to your family. Bring all your family members while you're at home and you can't go anywhere. Thank God for Corona. Bring the Holy Bible and make them sit around you and read the word of Jesus Christ, which is the sound of many waters, so soothing. So comforting, so delivering, so promising, so strengthening, so comforting. Utilize this time. Be wise and spend this moment with the Creator, the Savior, and the Redeemer of the world, the one and only, the sweetheart of all sweethearts, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to His holy, precious, adorable, worshipped name Jesus Christ of Nazareth amazing stunning breathtaking I love you Jesus I love you and I adore you Lord I worship you and I praise your holy name I thank you all my life and for eternities to come for eternities are never enough enough time to thank what you have done for me and everyone it is never enough to thank you Lord but I will still thank you and I will still praise you for I am indebted forever for you my Lord for what you've done no one can pay you back all I can say as a sinner thank you Jesus for your love, for your sacrifice, for your loyalty, for your honesty, for your presence, for your holiness, for your beauty, for your enlightenment, for your voice that is the sound of many waters, so soothing, so comforting. Jesus, we love you, we worship you, we adore you now and forever and ever and evermore. Amen. Well, we come to the conclusion of these verses from chapter 1, Revelation, verses 9 to 15. And with the Lord's grace, next Friday we will see you again at 7.30 p.m., Sydney local time, um, for the continuation um, with, with this commentary that we are doing through the uh, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the love of God the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit and the sacrifice of God the Son, Jesus Christ, revealed in the flesh, the Holy Trinity, one God, Amen. We shall continue the commentary on the book of Revelation, which is so, so current and so relevant to the 21st century, our time and age. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, protect you, and please send your questions. We have our email address appearing on the screen. Don't stop sending your questions because we want to hear from you, my beloveds. Very vital. Share with us what you have, and through the grace of our Lord, we shall answer all the questions that we get uh, at a, a later stage with the Lord's grace. Until then, may the Lord always be with you, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from every evil tribulation, whether it be visible or invisible, 
in the name of the Almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord, our God. Amen. Let us all stand now for the finale prayer, if you don't mind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. And the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. May the voice of Christ, the sound of many waters, be always with you. The soothing, the comforting, the delivering, the redemptive voice guide you, protect you now and forever and evermore. Amen. God bless.